And here we go. We are going to begin in another second uh, on 5A3. Um, the uh, Talmud, the Gemara, is going to begin discussing piece by piece the Mishnah that we looked at uh, last time. Um, so uh, there are a couple of elements in this Mishnah. Just to remind us, review a little bit. The first part of the Mishnah says that when it comes to talking about a big city, we define a big city um, as a city that has, at you know, at least ten batlanim. Batlanim, ten people who are who have nothing else to do. So the translation here is unoccupied people. And then um, this is with regard to which date the Megillah is read. And then we have um, the, the Mishnah goes in onto a certain uh, discussion of, well, since we're talking about the fact that the Megillah sometimes changes dates because it can't be read on Shabbat, so we go early, let's understand that, the, that actually the Megillah is an exception to our general approach. Our general approach is that certain things that we would uh, have to do at a particular time, if that particular time turns out to be Shabbat, we don't go early, we go later. And we, and we push the, the uh, ritual, the ceremony, the observance to the day after, the day after uh, sh uh, a Shabbat. So when we can't do something on Shabbat. So we're going to unpack some of those things soon. Now we're going to get a little bit of a review because some of this I, I, uh, I sort of uh, conveyed when we talked about uh, this uh, uh, 10 un unoccupied people uh, of a big town, a big city. Um, I brought you this uh, information that I took from here back when we looked at it earlier. Um, but uh, we're going to look at it now in its original place. So we're beginning on 5A3. It says Gemara. This is the beginning of the discussion of the, uh, of the Mishnah expanding the, the conversation, the interpretation, um, and so on. So I invite somebody... To unmute themselves and read the text, 583, top of the page. Who's going to do that? Okay, Beryl, thank you. The Gemara cites a Baraita which defines the 10 unoccupied men mentioned in the Mishnah. Atana taught the following clarification in a Baraita. 10 unoccupied men of the synagogue. Okay, so what did the Tana of the Brita do? What's, what, what did the Tana add? The synagogue. Right. In the, in the Mishnah, it simply says that a big city is defined as a city that has 10 unoccupied men. This Brita says, let's be very specific. We're talking about 10 occupied, unoccupied men in the Beit Knesset, in the synagogue. So that limits things a little bit. So in other words, we're not looking at the unemployment rate and saying, okay, if this is a city that has 10 people that don't have a job, so uh, then that's a big city, right? No, this is about being unoccupied in the synagogue. So what does that mean? And we've talked about this before. Um, the 10 people are unoccupied with anything else. And many examples, uh, many, many, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, commentators have talked about this. I summarized it last time. It means they're available in the synagogue to make the minion. The synagogue has a standing minion or a sitting minion, right? It's got its minion all the time. Mm -hmm. Then there are differences of opinion. Does it mean they actually have 10 people all the time in the Beit Knesset to have a minion any time that is needed, that's one way to read it. That's a very high bar. Another way of reading it is, no, they're available for the Beit Knesset. They may live, you know, across the street, 10 minutes away, but they're on call, right? They're always available to come to Shul to make a minion. That's another ex uh, explanation. A third explanation is that the Shul is always sure that they're going to get 10 people coming for a minion may not always be the same people, but they're always positive. We never have a problem getting a minion. Mm. I think that unfortunately Shomre was not able to say in the old days. 
Um, but some synagogues, that's what they say. We always have a minion. We never have a problem with a minion. So that's another way of reading it. So these are, I'm lowering the bar each time in terms of, uh, um, you know, the requirement and also the specificity of the people. And one last explanation is that it really is about 10 paid functionaries. So if you look at the uh, um, footnote number 19, um, the last paragraph, the third paragraph, where it says Sheiltot states, Beryl, you got that? These 10 men filled the following communal positions. There were three judges, two collectors of charity, one who helped them distribute the charity, one scribe, one court officer, one synagogue attendant, and one teacher of children. Right. So in other words, there was a, uh, uh, an institutional infrastructure that was established for education, for uh, um, synagogue life, for any legal uh, matters that had to be adjudicated, uh, and for um, social welfare, right? So these needs were, um, you know, institutionalized in, in, uh, in the form of these different people, and it comes out as a minimum to 10 people, and that's a real city. A real city is a city that takes responsibility for making sure that these needs are not dealt with ad hoc, but that they are all the time being looked into and being dealt with. So these are the, the different kinds of ways of understanding that very simple two-word uh, um, addition to our Mishnah. Sylvia, you wanted to say something. She disappeared. Sylvia, you're back. Did you want to say something? You have to unmute. No, I was just getting organized. I'm, I'm up here on the vineyard now, and I'm just kind of getting oh, organized. Oh, how's the weather? Beautiful. <laughs> well, guess what? It's beautiful here, too. Good. I'm glad to hear that. So I'm sorry. I was just... That's okay. That's okay. We're on 5A3. I didn't... I was looking for my... I didn't bring my... Uh, I have to reprint it. Okay. Okay. So, all right. Now we continue to the next part. That was, that's, that was an extensive Talmudic discussion. Right? Two words added to the Mishnah. Now, here we go to the next topic. Beryl, our Mishnah. Um, taught, it was regarding these times of Megillah reading that the sages said that at times we advance, but we do not postpone. Okay, and the word advance here is a little tricky. It means advance means bring it earlier. Right? For the Megillah reading, if you can't read it on the 14th or the 15th when you're supposed to, you read it earlier, right? So that's what the advance means, even earlier. We never put it later than the date that it's supposed to be read. Okay. The Gemara inquires. The Gemara inquires, what is the reason that the Megillah reading may not be postponed to a later day? The Gemara replies, Rabbi Abba said in the name of Shmuel, for the verse states, and it shall not pass, i.e., the Purim observance shall not be postponed beyond the special days. Okay, let's look at the verse itself. First, look at footnote 21, gives us the full verse. The verse reads, The Jews confirmed and undertook upon themselves and their Austerity and upon all who might join them, and it shall not pass to observe these two days in their prescribed manner and time every year. The Gemara explains the words, and it shall not pass, to mean that the Purim observance shall not be celebrated beyond the previously specified times, i.e., the 14th and 15th of Adar. And we've had this actually mentioned earlier in our discussions. So this is a way of, of, of uh, nailing down this rule within the very words of the Megillah itself. Um, it's not exactly the most explicit statement that you, uh, that you find. Uh, it's definitely an interpretation. It's definitely the usage of a phrase that seems to be a hanging phrase. It seems to be superfluous. 
um, the, 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 the verse would have been perfectly good. The Jews confirmed and undertook upon themselves their posterity, upon all of them I joined them to observe these two days in their prescribed manner and time every year. There it is, prescribed manner, prescribed time, every year, forever and ever, we've accepted to do this. Perfectly good sentence. So what is velo yavor, and it shall not pass? So it's, can't. That's, that phrase is asking to be interpreted. This is what's called in the rabbinic parlance, uh, I, you know, Eino uh, Omer uh, Ela Darsheni. It simply must be, uh, it's telling me, it's calling out to, to, to me, okay, interpret me. Use me for an interpretation. And the interpretation is that the rabbis decided that we're not going to uh, have Purim drag on forever afterwards. No, that's the... Uh, there's there's a, a, a phrase which I don't remember because I can't remember which one it is. It's uh, um, there's ad ad quem and there's another one. Stuart, you remember those that phrase? You know, terminus ad quem, terminus something quem. So okay, so in other words, it, it's a, it's the, the 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 end point that until that point or the or the end point. And from that point, right? In other words, the, you know, the, there's this, you know, when you have a period of time, you've got a beginning. Odd quem. Odd quem, and what's the other one? I think odd is from, and ad is to. So it at, A-T, E-D, what is it? Ad quem, yeah, I don't know. That's what I, yeah, so, yeah, I know the A-D, but I don't know the other one. I can't remember it right now. And it always gets me confused because I'm not, because in Hebrew, ad means until. So uh, so I always get mixed up about what it actually says. But <laughs> but it doesn't matter. So so the but this is a decision that the rabbis made, and they're they're hooking it onto, they're hanging it onto a phrase in the Megillah. I've mentioned this a few times already. They treat the Megillah, therefore, as the word of God where every single phrase cannot be superfluous. It must have meaning, right? And this, of course, is a self-referential and self-conscious decision. We know that this is a humanly created document. We know that this was a document written by Esther and Mordechai or whoever historically stands for Esther and Mordechai. Or, um, it's a human document. We know that for sure. And nevertheless, we treat it as if it is imbued with letter by letter, word for word, uh, uh, significance. So this is the decision, though, and as a result, Megillah, as I said, is the outlier. Almost everything else is treated as, if you can't do it at its proper time, so do it later. Megillah goes the other way around. Okay. Here we go. After the sight. Quran replies, Rabbi Abba right. said... Yes. I did that. Right. After citing one teaching of Rabbi Abba in the name of Shmuel, the Gemara now cites another. And Rabbi Abba also said in the name of Shmuel, from where is it known that we do not count days to calculate years? I.e., a year is 12 full months, regardless of the number of days they contain. Okay. So, so, um, what the uh, Rabbi Abba, uh, you know, says in the name of Shmuel is that when we have a case where we need to measure something from one year to the next, not every year has the identical number of days as every other year. Mm -hmm. So what do we, do we, do we have a specific number of days that we define as a year or does the calendar date define the year? So, you know, the, the, uh, you know if, if, uh, if one year is a leap year and one year is not, and let's say in the English calendar, one year is a leap year and one year is not. So we usually have 365 days for a year, right? And a leap year is 366. So is a year, since we commonly conceive of a year as 365 days, if I say I'm, I'm, I, I'm going to exercise for a, for a year, so let's say I'm making, I'm taking a, you know, a New Year's uh, resolution or in Jewish law, if I make a, a commitment, an oath to do this, then it's very serious. You do so it. if I, if I say I'm doing this for a year, does it mean I'm doing it 
for if if today is is uh, what is today June twenty eighth or something twenty ninth twenty eighth twenty eighth. So do I? Does that mean I have to do it from June twenty eighth until next year through June twenty seventh? No. Or does it mean no? I have to count three hundred and sixty five days. What if the next year is three, is, three, is longer? So on. So what what uh, Rabbi Abba says in the name of Shmuel is no. We we do not count how many days are in the year. It's a year. A year is a year. We just simply you know notate what the date is. So it's twelve full months, and that's all. It doesn't matter how many days. Of course, in the Jewish calendar, it gets more serious. <laughs> in the Jewish calendar, it's not a leap year of one day. It's a leap year of a whole month. Right, so then we have sometimes questions. For instance, yard sites and so on, but uh, we're not going to go into that. Okay, so he, then he just gives you a quote. Right? How do we know? How do we know that we do not count days to calculate years? For it states of the months of the year, which teaches <coughs> that you count months to calculate years, but you do not count days to calculate years. Okay. So that's the first uh, of a number of teachings that are being preserved here simply because, oh, you mentioned Rabbi Abba in the name of Shmuel. Here's a couple of other things. Now, they do have to do with time, right? They do have to do with keeping time, with how we calculate time. So the, the Megillah uh, law is about time, right? When we can't do it on its, on its correct time, do we go earlier or do we go later? And now we have other, other uh, uh, issues about, about time. And now we have another tradition. And the rabbis of Caesarea said in the name of Rabbi Abba, from where is it known that we do not reckon hours to calculate months? For it states, until a month of days, which teaches that you reckon days to calculate months, but you do not reckon hours to calculate months. Okay. So uh, now you have a note 24 gives you uh, some of the details of this. Um, one, one second, one second, one second, just to summarize it or, or give a little preface to this. In the Hebrew calendar, we work with the lunar months and the lunar months are a little inexact, right? Because the lunar months, first of all, they were determined in the old days by eyewitness. So sometimes... A person would see the new moon, and sometimes they wouldn't see the new moon until the next day. Therefore, lunar months get determined to be either 29 days or 30 days. Actually, they're 29 and a half days. So, and we just simply have to do it one way or the other. So that's what this tradition is about, right? If we say for a, for a whole month, I'm going to do X, Y, Z, do we mean 29 and a half days or do we just mean the month? So that could be either a half a day less or it could be a half a day more, right? It could be six hours, uh, 12 hours more or 12 hours less than the real um, uh, cycle of the moon going around. So read 24 then, please, just to clarify that a little bit. For example, if one divorces his wife on condition that he does not return within a month, the divorce takes effect if he does not return by the same date of the next month, even if the full 29 and a half days have not elapsed, i.e., the month is, def is a deficient month. A full month has 30 days. The next month begins at the end of day 31. Eve. On the eve. On the eve of day 31. A deficient month has 29 days. The next month begins at the eve of day 30. Thus, if one makes such a stipulation during a deficient 29-day month, his month expires approximately 12 hours before huh. the period of a full lunar cycle. We do not reckon okay. this for yeah, hours. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. It's calculating the month. Right. So, okay, so the, the situation is a situation that we could imagine. We could write a whole short story about it. Um, people are together. 
there's a little question about whether somebody should go off and do something or not. They're not, they're not uh, uh, in full agreement and support about doing this. The person says, I'm going anyway. Um, the, other, the, the wife says, no, I don't want you to go. Um, and he says, look, I'm not leaving you, but here's a bill of divorce on condition so that you don't get left as a grass widow. If you're, you're, you're afraid that I'm not going to come back, you know, maybe it's a military mission. Maybe he's just, she just doesn't trust him. So <laughs> she doesn't want to be left uh, hanging. So he says, okay, I really promise I'm coming back. And if somehow or other I don't return for whatever reason, um, you don't have to go running after me. Here is your bill of divorce that's given on condition that I don't come back within a month. What is now the question is, when does that condition kick in? So does it require a full 29 and a half days? Or depending on what month we're talking about, it could be either 29 days or it could be 30 days, which is more than 29 and a half. So this has legal implications and it has you know life-changing implications. So this is the decision that we simply go by the calendar date. We don't start counting the hours and so on. Okay, so these are all time-related uh, determinations that we have made. Okay, now we come back to the examples that the Mishnah gave about where we go in the opposite direction. When we start delaying an observance rather than making it happen earlier. Megillah we make earlier, but all these other observances we actually push off into a later date. How does that work? So 5A3, top column on the right. Our Mishnah said, but the time of the wood offering of the Kohanim and the fast of Tishba'av and the... Chagiga. You taught me how to say this last week. Hagiga offering and the assembly are at times postponed and not advanced to an earlier time. Okay, Gemara, so those are all the examples from the Mishnah. Now we go one by one. The Gemara explains why these are never advanced. The fast of Tishba'av is not advanced because we do not advance the commemoration of calamity. The festival sacrifice and the assembly, the festival sacrifice and the assembly are not advanced because the time of their obligation has not yet arrived, and one would thus not fulfill his obligation by doing it earlier. Okay, so let's stop here for a minute, and let's look at what's been explained. So, the fast of Tisha B'Av, we don't make it come earlier, right? If the ninth B'Av is on Saturday, we don't make the fast happen on the eighth above, right? We don't make it happen a day earlier. Instead, we push it off till Sunday. Okay, this has happened many times. Um, why not? Why don't we just get it over with? Why don't we just have it happen uh, um, earlier, just like we do the Megillah earlier? The answer is because we're not in a rush to be in mourning. Uh, we're not. We're not. We're not uh, jumping at the chance to uh, uh, sit on the on the on the ground and bemoan uh, the destruction of the temple, the destruction of the Jewish people. So we, 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 uh, we put it off rather than make it earlier. With Megillah, we're happy to do it earlier. We're happy to celebrate. We're happy to add days of celebration. Um, but uh, for, the, for, the, for the morning observance of Tisha B'Av, we shouldn't be in any rush. In terms of uh, that, just a, a, a slight, slight kind of uh, uh, corollary is... For instance, when we, God forbid, have a funeral um, and uh, we're at the cemetery for the burial and the casket is being carried to the grave. We don't carry, except in these terrible, terrible times when there's danger for safety of people, but in normal quote unquote times, we take the casket to the grave slowly. We stop a number of times. Some customs we stop seven times. Some customs we stop three times. Why are we stopping? Because we're showing our reluctance 
to actually finally get to this point. We're not we're not trying to throw this person, you know, into the grave and and, and get get rid with it, get, get rid of it. So we are we're we're pushing off that that sadness and that tragedy. So with regard to Tishabov, that's the that's the Gemara's answer. Okay. So now the other two examples that they talk about here are that the Chagiga, um, which is the uh, festival celebration sacrifice that each family would bring when they made uh, the, the pilgrimage, right? When they came to uh, the temple uh, on Passover, on Sukkot, Shavuot, they were obligated to bring a sacrifice that was a celebration sacrifice in the sense that this was, I mentioned it last time, this was the way that you catered your holiday meal. Everybody, you invited everybody to celebrate the holiday with you. And for instance, Pesach, when we have a wonderful big in the in the normal days, right? The good old days, they should be coming, uh, uh, you know, the Mehei Rabbi Ameno, soon in our days. Um, and you invite all kinds of guests to, to, to your house and you have to cook up a lot of food. So that is an obligation to celebrate the holiday with joy and to include people in your celebration. So therefore, what do you, how do you actually make sure that you have all that food? The answer is you have to get the food all pre uh, prepared. And to, to use a, a, a phrase from, uh, uh, from a, a book about bar and bat mitzvah, and you put God on the guest list. Mm -hmm. So you, you make a sacrifice. God gets to eat all the blood and guts and, uh, that are put on the altar, so to speak. And then the rest of the, the animal is now edible. Once you've given God God's portion, the rest of the animal is then uh, um, eaten by you and your family and your friends. So that's what's called a shlamim, a well-being sacrifice or a celebratory sacrifice. So on, on a holiday, that's how you celebrate your holiday. So that sacrifice, what happens if, it, if the holiday falls on Shabbat? So the, that sacrifice is not given on Shabbat. It has to be put off to the next day. So, and Hakel, which is the day where everybody is invited to come to listen to the Torah reading. Uh, and the king would read the Torah to the, all of the thousands and hundreds of thousands of people that were gathered in Jerusalem um, on Sukkot. Um, if that day happened to fall, it was the day after uh, um, the first day of Yontiv, of Sukkot. If it happened to be on Shabbat, we didn't do it on Shabbat. We did it on the next day. So the Gemara is asking, why not? Why don't we just, why don't, why don't we do it? Why do we push it off? Why do we do it? Why don't we do it earlier? The answer is the time of their obligation has not yet arrived. Hmm. This is a time related mitzvah. Right, it kicks in at a very specific time, and and when that time hasn't arrived yet, then the obligation itself has not uh, kicked in, and therefore, if you do this ritual at its improper time, you're not doing the ritual at all. You're not uh, uh, fulfilling your obligation. Your obligation is to do this action at this particular time. Okay, so uh, um, this is um, an explanation that should raise a question with regard to Megillah, no? Yeah, Stuart. Right, I mean, it just seems completely circular. The, 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 fir the distinction between Tisha B'Av and Purim, okay, um, but here we're saying, it's saying, the question is, when, is the, when does the obligation arise? And they're answering that question by saying the, uh, the obligation arises when the obligation arises. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't help us resolve the Purim question. It's saying the festival sacrifice in the assembly arise the obligation arises when it arises, and you can't do it earlier than that. But that's the whole question we're trying to answer here. Right. So so this is so I want to just even sharpen it even a little bit more, and say if the obligation to celebrate Purim is on Purim. You can't celebrate Purim 
uh, on December 25th. Okay, I just took that date out of my, out of as at rent. So, uh, but uh, right, thank you, Jen, for laughing. So, uh, um, but uh, you know, you can't just pick any old date. You know, it's Purim. You celebrate Purim when it's Purim. Right. So, how is it that we're able to make the Purim celebration happen earlier at all? If this this is a very logical thing. If if you haven't become obligated to do something, then when you're doing it, it it's it's you know you may be having fun, you may be uh, you know doing something that's that's cool for you, but it has not it doesn't have the nature of of uh, this mitzvah. So how did that happen with with Purim that we can go earlier? Purim doesn't kick in until the 14th or 15th. Yes, Jen. I, I it's I don't have a technical answer, but I'm just wondering whilst all this was being argued, what were people actually doing? Poor, poor. Never like, know. So, okay, we have no idea. Like they, we can extrapolate a little bit. Every once in a while, we'll get a little, a little, uh, you know, uh, glimpse. Um, glimpse. Thank you, of you know, from a story or something. But in general, this is the 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 standard, uh, you know, problem of all historians. You only have the historical documents that you have. Yeah. All the people that yeah. don't, all the people that that are not creating documents. You have no idea. Are they following the same thing that the documents say? Are they doing something else? So um, I was wondering if these questions came up because these people over there were celebrating it at this time, and the, you know, right, like right, is that how right. this all happened to begin with? Correct. Correct. You're absolutely right. So we do have. It depends how wide you want to, you know, uh, uh, spread your net. But I want to. So I'm going to answer that. I'm going to relate to what you're saying in in a second. But I want to come back to this. We have a very specific time when Purim is, so how can we make it earlier? The answer is, that's why we have to remember the five pages or the four pages, page two, page three, and page four that we studied already. That was what that whole discussion was earlier, was to find scriptural license, and not just license, but actual um, obligation to celebrate Purim earlier. That's why we read those verses, and it says bismanehem at their appointed times, plural. And that's where the, the Talmud comes up with this idea that there's not just one time for Purim, but there are a number of times. And it can be the 12th and the 13th and the 14th, the 11th, the 12th, the 13th, and the 14th and the 15th. They are all Purim. They're all potential Purim dates, but not the 10th. You can't do you can't celebrate Purim on the 10th. One second, please. Hey, I'm in the middle of teaching. I'll call you back later, okay? So um, so yes, we needed to figure out that actually prescribed times for Purim were multiple. But we don't have that with regard to Passover and Shavuot and Sukkot. The prescribed time is very clear. It's a biblically de decreed prescribed time, and doing anything before that prescribed time doesn't count. So this is actually filling in the weirdness of Purim, right? It fills in a little bit more of the dimensions of how we should appreciate how weird Purim really is, that it is this created holiday that that has flux time to it, right? It's got a, it's got a funny relationship to time in a way that so many other mitzvot uh, do not have. Um, okay, um, let's continue. A ton of toys. Oh, wait, I said I was gonna talk about uh, what, what uh, Jen brought up. So this that's a big question. The big question always is, is how many people are following what the Talmud is talking about and how many people are not following that's one way to ask the question. Or another question, way to ask the question is, how many Judaisms are, are current at any particular time? And, and do we have access to other, other ways that people were, you know, lived a Jewish life besides the recorded methods, uh, the, the, the recorded way of life that we have in the rabbinic documents? And the answer is sometimes the rabbinic documents mention controversies where certain uh, uh, other groups are acknowledged as having a different opinion. And the rabbinic opinion is in contrast and in conflict with some other opinion. So for instance, one of the famous ones is uh, Shavuot, right? When it says you should start counting the Omer, 
um, in the Torah, it says, count the Omer, count 49 days, and then on the 50th day, you have Shavuot. When are you supposed to start counting? So the Torah says, you're supposed to start counting from the day after the day of rest. So what does that mean, the day of rest? So the rabbi said the day of rest is Yantif. So the first day of Pesach is a day of rest. And then starting on the night after the first day of Pesach, so for instance, in, out here in, in, in the diaspora land, in uh, the second night of Pesach, when we have our second Seder, we add the beginning of the counting of the Omer. And then we count the 49 days, and then 50 days after Pesach is Shavuot. That's not what some other communities, they're called Baitusim by the rabbis. It seems that this was also uh, reflected by certain communities that are uh, recorded in the Dead Sea Scrolls documents. They, did, they said the day of rest means Shabbos. So you don't start counting the Omer until you get to a Shabbat. So if Passover falls on Wednesday, then we start counting Wednesday night. According to these other groups, you don't count Wednesday night and you don't count Thursday night and you don't count Friday night. You start counting on Saturday night. And guess what? According to that, Shavuot always comes out on Sunday. There is no variation of when Shavuot can come up. In our calendar, there are different days that Shavuot can happen, just like because there are different days that Pesach can happen, just like there are different days that Rosh Hashanah can happen. But other people had calendars where all of these things were actually locked into specific days of the week uh, that, that they worked on. So we are aware, for instance, of a variation in that way. But that's one kind of question. Another kind of question is, let's say I think of myself not as one of that group. Am I listening to the rabbis? Right? And uh, given human nature, I would say some people did and some people didn't. Yeah, Sylvia, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I did. We're talking about uh, Purim. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering, why is there no equivalent discussion in here about Hanukkah? Which what, also what seems to be a later, histo more historical holiday. What do you mean by an equivalent conversation? You mean, yes, why is there no big, what, what, big, thick the, tractate about Hanukkah? No, no. But I mean, they mention the other holidays in Megillah. Why, why aren't they also mentioning the same problem with, with Hanukkah? Okay, so, so, so you're noticing that Hanukkah is on Hanukkah and no other time. I don't right? know when it is. <laughs> you know? Hanukkah is on the 25th day of Kislev, right? That's the beginning date of Hanukkah. For eight days, we have Hanukkah, right? We have no variations in time for Hanukkah, right? So that's... As you, you know, by comparison, that's an interesting thing. There is no wiggle room on Hanukkah. And the um, observance of Hanukkah is such that it is completely possible to observe Hanukkah without violating Shabbat. So there is no conflict that Hanukkah could come into with Shabbat, even though there always will be a Shabbat in Hanukkah, because Hanukkah is eight days. So there's always going to be a Shabbat somewhere in Hanukkah. But we can always light the candles right before Shabbat begins. So in terms of ritual observance, there is no ritual observance in Hanukkah that butts its head against the restrictions of Shabbat. So Shabbat, therefore Hanukkah never has any adjustments that have to be made in terms of the calendar. So, so the corollary to that is we have some of the Torah prescribed holidays with specific dates, uh, thus and such a thus and such month, and apparent, I don't know where the date from Hanukkah for Hanukkah is established, but these other holidays are sort of dateless. They just they're approximated. Well, there, which other? Where does where, where does the date of Hanukkah come from? The date of Hanukkah comes from the anniversary of when the temple was purified. Okay, but where is that? You know, where is that date? History. Written? It's written in the Talmud. It's written in the Book of Maccabees. That comes way before the Talmud. So the, the holiday of Hanukkah is established as a historical anniversary, and it's you know it's 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 marked on that anniversary. Tisha B'av is also not a biblical, not a Torah holiday. It's it's a holiday, and in fact, the date of Tisha B'av is is a kind of a conventionalized date 
because it, it, it includes anniversaries of, of a bunch of tragedies that happened all within that week. So um, Tisha B'Av is accepted as the national day of mourning. It's established by us. And, and the, the observance, though, is not compatible with observing Shabbat. So therefore, it has to be pushed aside. The observance of Hanukkah is compatible with observing Shabbat. Could one say that, maybe I'm wrong, that, that Purim does not have a specific date specific within the story that something happened. Is that no, correct? that's incorrect. Purim that establishes incorrect. the dates. Purim establishes, the Megillah establishes the 14th and the 15th. But from where? What do you mean from where? Okay, well. The, the story says we, we have, as it says here, we have accepted upon ourselves to, to celebrate Purim every year on these okay. dates. So they've decided. And the dates are in the Megillah. The 14th okay. and the 15th is for the walled cities. These are all in the Megillah. Okay. okay. Just a, a quick question about Hanukkah and Shabbat. So if on Arab Shabbat, on the beginning of Shabbat, you light the Hanukkah candles before the Shabbos candles, and at, on, at Havdalah, you light them, I guess, after Havdalah. So, I mean, technically, aren't you lighting, you are making an adjustment because you're not lighting the Hanukkah candles at precisely the time that you would when it's not Shabbat. Not necessarily. If I, you know, there could be all kinds of exigencies for when you're going to light those candles. The point is that the candles should be light lit for the sake of Hanukkah for that evening. I have to. I have worked the night shift. I have okay. to on, on on Tuesday night of Hanukkah. I'm not going to be able to 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 light candles after the 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 stars come out. So I I light no. candles that will light long enough, and then I leave for work. But you're not actually lighting Shabbat candles ever on Shabbat. Shabbat candles cannot be lit on Shabbat. Yeah, not Shabbat yeah. candles. You're never lighting. So that's uh, the idea. That you, but you're Shabbat. able to light the candles for to honor that day or that night of Hanukkah. You know, by doing it a little earlier. That happened. That could happen any night of the week. Okay. So okay. So back to here. Okay. Um, we're continuing at the middle of the of the column. Matana taught. Beryl, you still with us? Matana taught in a baraita. We can postpone the Hagiga offering and all the time of the Hagiga offering. The Gemara seeks to understand the meaning of this baraita. Now, the statement that we can postpone the Hagiga offering is understandable, for it means that if the first day of Yom Tov falls on the Sabbath, we postpone the Hagigah offering to after the Sabbath. But what is meant in the Baraita by the words, the time of the Hagigah offering. Right. So that the, the, the question is, we understand when we say we should postpone giving the, offering the Hagigah. Right. There are times when we are forced to postpone the Hagigah. When is that time? If the Chagiga, if the first day of Yontif is on Shabbos, the obligation to bring the Chagiga kicks in with the with the holiday, but the holiday is Shabbat also. So yeah, that we postpone. We postpone the Chagiga. The question is, what does it mean? And the whole time of the Chagiga is postponed. What does that mean? What does that extra phrase mean? Okay. The Gemara presents various explanations. Rav Oshaya said, this is what the Baraita means. When the time of the Hagigah offering falls on the Sabbath or when the time of the Ola of Re'iyah falls even on Yom Tov, which is the actual time of the Hagigah offering, we postpone it. Okay. So this is his explanation. His explanation is that we're talking about not just the Hagigah, but also the Ola Re'iyah. The Olat Rehiyah is another sacrifice, and it's different from the Chagiga sacrifice. The Chagiga sacrifice I mentioned before is a sacrifice that's meant to be eaten substantially, overwhelmingly by human beings. That's your celebration meal. That's your Yontav meal, just that in, to acknowledge God in the meal, you give a little piece to, on the altar. That's the Chagiga. Now we have the, the olat riya, the word ola, is completely going up in smoke. This is a sacrifice 
where human beings have nothing, no benefit whatsoever from the sacrifice. It's all given to God. It's almost the opposite of the of the Chagiga sacrifice. But that's also an obligatory sacrifice. This is what's called the Olat Ri'ya. Ri'ya means seeing. And this is what pilgrimage was all about. The pilgrimage holidays, says the Torah, are the three times in the year when you come to see and be seen, not by everybody else in the community, which is the way we so much want uh, uh, our holidays to be. It's an important part of our holiday celebrations to be to see and be seen everybody else, but to see and, and be seen by God. We come to see God, quote unquote. We come to come into God's house and be stand in God's presence. And of course the, the uh, imagery is a little bit literal, and that's okay, because people's religious experience is assumed to be possible to the point of ecstasy, right? That if people came into this uh, 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 temple, this shrine, with the right kind of uh, mental and emotional uh, uh, attunement, they would feel that they are standing right before God and feel God's presence and see God in some way. So the idea is to see God and to be seen by God. When we have a psalm that we sing, a, a phrase from um, on uh, a whole month of Elul, the month leading into Rosh Hashanah, we go, There's only one thing that I ask from God. It's the one thing that I desire more than anything else. Shifti beveit Hashem kol yemei chayai larzot benoam benoam Hashem ulevakir behechalo. I want to simply dwell in God's house all the days of my life to look at God's beauty. Right, I want to see the beauty of God. That's the psalm uh, statement, and there are many other many places where we could say that. Uh, uh, where we could, you know, cite things like that. So the olatriya is meant to accompany that almost mystical experience. I come before God to see God and for God to see me. God, you know, this is like, like you know, the 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 phone call. So when are you? When are you coming over? You're not coming for the holidays. What do you mean, right? So um, I want to see you. If I love you, I want to see you. So God says that to the Jewish people. I want to see you. So when we go to visit God's house, we bring a gift. That's all God's. That's not just the holiday gift of the meal that we cook for everybody else. That's another part of this. But this is meant to be, this is, I'm coming to your house. Here is a gift only for you. That's that second sacrifice. So now what Rav Oshaya says is this brightam is meaning to include that second sacrifice as also being pushed off. Okay, let's look at note 30. That is, even though the Chagiga offering, well, you got it? Yeah, I'm going back. Even though the Hagiga offering of Shalami may be offered on Yom Tov, the Ola of Re'iya may not be offered on Yom Tov, but must be postponed until Hol Hamed. Hol, hol, hol Hamed. Hol Hamoed. Hol Hamoed, on which the labor restrictions are greatly relaxed. The Hagiga offering may be offered on Yom Tov because as the Shalamim portions of its meat are eaten either by the Kohen or by the owner of the, his household. And his Thus, house and his household. Thus, its slaughter is permitted on Yom Tov. Since labors are necessary for the preparation of food are permitted on Yom Tov. The Ola of Re'iya, however, which is entirely consumed on the altar, has no portion for human consumption. Thus, the labor involved in its offering does not receive the dispensation granted by the Torah for the preparation of food. Accordingly, the Baraita is to be interpreted as follows. 
we postpone the Hagigah offering if its time arrives on the Sabbath, as well as another offering that we postpone even beyond the time of the Hagigah offering. Okay, this so that's that's the the way that that Rabbi Shai is is suggesting this. So this has a couple of of uh, um, elements to it that need a little bit more clarification, maybe. So. What we started with is that when the holiday falls on Shabbat, we have to push off certain observances because Shabbat precludes the, the ritual that's involved. So this brings us backwards a little bit. What happens when the holiday is not on Shabbat? What happens when Passover or Shavuot or Sukkot fall on, uh, you know, like I say, my favorite the choice, Wednesday. Let's say it falls on Wednesday. Then what do you do? So then the answer is you naturally bring your... Uh, Chagiga offering on that day so that you can celebrate the first day of Yantif together with friends and family, the owner and his household and, and, and the priest gets invited and God gets a little piece on the altar. So that happens on Yantif itself. How is that the case? Because there's a big difference between Shabbat and Yom Tov, even to this day. Cooking is, pro is prohibited on Shabbat traditionally not allowed to cook anything on Shabbat. However, on Yom Tov, you can cook. In fact, you should cook because you want to have a, a, a wonderful holiday meal. So anything that's involved with cooking, you are allowed to do on Yom Tov. So here, this shlamim sacrifice, this is part of what you need to prepare your meal. So of course it happens on Yom Tov because it's part of the celebration of the holiday with regard to physically consuming the food uh, as as a as a as a as a joyful uh, celebration of the holiday, so that's the shlamim, that's the 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 well-being sacrifice, the chagiga. But the olat riyah is the gift that we give to God that goes only to God, and no human consumption is involved. If no human consumption is involved. We're not allowed to do that on the holiday. So let's imagine now again what this is all about. Here it is. We're giving a gift to God. It's the holiday of, of, of Passover, Sukkot, Shavuot. We're coming to see God. What could be more holy than that? Let's offer the sacrifice. And the answer is no. The answer is there are certain rules of sanctity that override this deep religious uh, um, gesture you'll be able to give God the gift tomorrow when it's not holiday, when it's cholamoed, when it's the intermediate days of the holiday. That's when you'll give God the gift, and it'll count, and it's perfect, it's wonderful. But you do not violate the sanctity of the day, even if it's for, quote-unquote, God's sake. So a very interesting decision that was made in our tradition. So therefore, says Rabbi Oshaya, that's what is being said here. There are two kinds of postponement. When it comes to the Chagiga, the Chagiga is postponed if the first day of the holiday is Shabbat. But all other days of the week when the holiday begins, we don't postpone the Chagiga. And then when it comes to this other sacrifice, the Olat Riyah, that sacrifice is postponed from the first day of the holiday always. Okay, yeah, Sylvia. The question of preparation of food or not on Shabbat raises a question in my mind whether there was ever <clears throat> the prohibition on Shabbat, whether there was ever a discussion of a fast day on each Shabbat. That's why we don't have Tisha B'Av on Shabbat. There are no fast days on Shabbat. No, but I'm, I'm going one step further. Was there ever an early discussion of whether in order to keep the day, you know, you can't work, should you therefore fast? So not in rabbinic literature, the opposite. We have in Isaiah, it's the Haftorah that we read on Yom Kippur. You are ukratem le Shabbat oneg. You are supposed to call Shabbat a day of pleasure. The rabbinic approach says, means that you're not allowed to fast. Shabbat should not be a day of discomfort or, or now. We think that any restriction on us is a, it may causes discomfort, and we and we don't uh, basically in our community keep Shabbat in any way that impinges on our freedom. 
The rabbis didn't see that as, as an issue. The rabbi said it's absolutely possible to live a simple life on Shabbat that is a day of joy, and it requires light and heat and food. So Shabbos candles was the rabbinic insistence that on Friday night there should be light in your house. But don't light the fire on Shabbat. Light it before Shabbat. Yes, Yom, Yom Kippur is the, one ex is the one exception. Yom Kippur is the only day that we fast on Shabbat because Yom Kippur is explicitly said to be a double Shabbat, where the Torah says, fast on this day of Shabbat. So therefore, that was the one decision that we made, that all fasts are, are impossible on Shabbat, but not Yom Kippur. But back to, that was just in the chat there. So, but back to what, what I was uh, saying to, to Sylvia, that, that when it comes to Shabbat observance, the rabbis who we see as, uh, you know, very, very restrictive, were actually more lenient than a lot of other uh, uh, groups, back to Jen's point before. The non-rabbinic uh, ways of, 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 of uh, uh, keeping uh, Judaism, some of them were much more ascetic and much more restrictive. So we know, for instance, that lighting the, the candles for Shabbat was a rabbinic insistence in the face of communities that said, you're not allowed to have a fire in your house on Shabbat, period, ever, even if you light it ahead of time. You have to sit in the dark and enjoy it. So this was a, a, dis, a, a disagreement, a fundamental disagreement. That's why we make a blessing on lighting the candles for Shabbat. The Torah never tells us to light candles for Shabbat. But the rabbi said, no, make a blessing because this is part of enjoying Shabbat, that you should have light in your house. We now just use it as a symbol, right? And, and we do hopefully enjoy it. We have these beautiful two candles or five candles, or however many candles different people light. Um, you know, some people light according to the, to the people in the household. Um, but you certainly light at least two. So... You know, it's nice to see the two candles. It makes you feel good. But the original impetus for lighting those candles was to have light. It was about having a lamp lit in your house so that you could see where you're going, you could see each other, you could stay up a little bit later and, and, and hang out and schmooze so that when you ate your dinner, it was uh, within, you know, within uh, um, a lit room so you could see what you're eating. Um, it was all about enhancing the enjoyment of Shabbat. So not fasting on Shabbat was a decision that the rabbis made. And yes, there were certain, you know, ways of approaching holiness and, and serving God that were very ascetic. And they said, no, fasting would be a good thing. And we rejected it. Okay. So we're going to continue a little bit. That's one explanation. And now we have turned the page. This is now 5A4. The Gemara notes, according to Rav Oshaya's explanation, who is the author of this Baraita, which rules that the Ola of Re'iyah cannot be offered on Yom Tov? It is Beit Shmuel for... Beit Shammai. Beit Shammai for we learned in a Mishnah, Beit Shammai say, bring... We may, we may, we may yes. bring Shalamim offerings on Yom Tov, though we may not lean on them, but we may not bring Ola offerings. And Beit Hillel say, we may bring Shalamim offerings and Ola offerings, and we may lean on them. Okay, so... This is a basic distinction between Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai. And now we find out that this blanket prohibition against bringing the gift to God alone, the Ola, the, the sacrifice that it goes up in smoke uh, to God, that rule that you can't do that on Yom Tov in the middle of the week, that's only Beit Shammai. It's not Beit Hillel. So this is, of course, one of the famous, famous uh, um, distinctions that we have throughout our uh, rabbinic uh, history. There were two schools of thought. Um, they, Shammai means the house of Shammai. Those that followed 
in the footsteps of the great sage Shammai and Beit Hillel, the house of Hillel, all the disciples that followed in the footsteps of Hillel. And Hillel and Shammai were the two early, early, early sages. Notice that they don't have the name Rabbi in front of them. So a lot of times when you hear people say Rabbi Hillel, they're being anachronistic. Hillel did not, was never called Rabbi because the name, the, the title hadn't yet become uh, common. He lived before the temple was destroyed. Hillel and Shammai are of the earliest generations of named sages that we have. So, uh, um, and, the, and the rabbinic title doesn't come into, into currency until after the temple was destroyed. Hillel lived about 100 years before the temple was destroyed. The temple was destroyed in 70 CE. And uh, uh, Hillel and Shammai. Their houses continued for uh, generations. And they were two schools of thought. And to be a little unfair, but, but uh, maybe a little helpful. It was a kind of a liberal versus conservative philosophy of law. Shammai was much more stringent, usually, and Hillel was much more lenient, usually. So here we have a case where, or restrictive or and, and non-restrictive. So Shammai was, uh, and the house of Shammai was of the opinion that we just had, that if there's no human consumption of this sacrifice on uh, uh, Yom Tov, then we can't offer that sacrifice on Yom Tov, the individual sacrifice of Olat Re'iyah. And one of the things that is part of the ceremony is the leaning onto the sacrifice. The way that you made the sacrifice your surrogate, which is part of what sacrifices were about. Right? Sacrifices were, were saying, I would, I'm offering myself to you, God, but instead of my, uh, putting myself on the altar, Here's an animal that I'm offering in my stead. So the way that you transferred the, uh, your identity to the animal was the leaning, smicha, right? That you actually leaned onto the animal and sort of invested the animal with your own identity. So that leaning uh, is uh, uh, forbidden on Yom Tov. There's a, lo there's a long note um, about uh, uh, about this, that uh, um, you're not allowed to use the animal for support, just like you're not allowed to ride the animal on on Yom Tov and Shabbat. So um, so Shammai said you can't do it, and Hillel said no. Let's look at thirty four. Beit Hillel, take the limiting expression for you to exclude work done to provide for the consumption of non-Jews rather than to exclude the consumption of the altar. Rashi from Beitza. On the contrary, that work may be done on Yom Tov to provide for altar consumption is indicated in a previous verse. Okay, which... we'll skip the rest of the verse. What I wanted to, to bring out is this distinction of, of what's permissible on Yom Tov or not. The idea that you are allowed to cook on Yom Tov comes from reading the verse that says that this should be a celebration for you. So the rabbis understood that to mean, well, if you're going to benefit from the celebration physically by eating the food, you can prepare it on Yom Tov. So Beishamai says, okay, so you can prepare the food if there's human consumption, then Yom Tov is, uh, the celebration of Yom Tov includes that provision. But completely offering a sacrifice on the altar to God, there is no human consumption. So that's not for you. And Hillel says, that's not what the words for you means. For you means for you in the celebration of this holiday. And therefore it could be physically enjoying a celebration by eating, or it could be for you, the ritual of giving God some obeisance, some homage, some gift. It, what does it exclude? It excludes other people that are not celebrating the holiday, non-Jews. Non-Jews are not celebrating Pesach. So you're not allowed to do things on Yom Tov that are not for you, that are not for the sake of the Jewish observance of the holiday. 
And the Jewish observance, of course, includes Jews, but it also includes God, doesn't it? So Beit Hillel is saying, of course, you can offer God the old, the, 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 the sacrifice uh, of the of the Olat Re'iya. Um, the next note points out that there's another wrinkle in 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 how these uh, uh, two dis uh, uh, disagreements come about, because Beit Shammai says that you have to lean on the animal right at the very moment of the sacrifice. And since leaning on the animal on Yontav is not allowed, then you have to postpone the, the, the sacrifice for that reason as well. And Hillel says the same thing, like I said before, about lighting Hanukkah candles or something like that. He says, no, lean on the animal before Yontav. You can, you can have a, a, a little bit earlier time for leaning on the animal, for transferring. It doesn't have to be exactly at the very moment of sacrifice. Therefore, we're not going to uh, transgress the sanctity of the holiday by doing extraneous things. The extraneous stuff you do before the holiday. And then the necessary part of the sacrifice, the slaughtering, and then offering it on the altar, that you do on the holiday because that's your worship to God. Sylvia. This may be way off base, but <clears throat> this is talking about trying to find out who wrote the Baraita, which is not included in the Talmud. And it, it then it then says that the, that Baraita was written by the conservative uh, Shammai. Does that sort of indicate that there was a leaning towards a more progressive inclusion uh, into the Torah, into the uh, Talmud? The, yes, the, in general, the Talmud, and has discussions other places, the Talmud comes down on the side of Hillel 99% of the time. So the reason that the, that the uh, um, attribution of this Brita to Beit Shammai is very significant is that it means, okay, it's an early Brita. Brita are, are authoritative unless we can figure out that they are the, uh, the opinion of a sage whose opinion we reject. So by citing a Brita, we start out with the with the assumption, okay, you know, it's innocent and it's proven guilty. When we have a Brita, then it usually means, okay, this is an important authoritative teaching and we should follow it. But once we do this digging that the that the Talmud does, it now emerges that the that the citation that we have, this this formulation that we have of, of the law, ends up being only Beit Shammai. Well, if it's Beit Shammai, then we don't have to follow it because we follow Beit Hillel. We know that there's a dissenting opinion and the opinion of Beit Hillel is the generally accepted opinion in 99% of the cases. We have a general rule that the halacha is according to Beit Hillel, except for very, very few named cases. So yes, that's what's accomplished by doing this. It ends up saying, well, it's only that, that other uh, uh, group and we and we have decided already long ago that we're not accepting their opinion. It's 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 no archived. It's it's there for people to study, but it's not accepted as law. Okay. In other words, we could have had a very 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 much more restrictive. Absolutely, uh, Beit Shammai, oh, Beit Shammai overwhelmingly is more restrictive than Beit Hillel. Um, and uh, and we have almost always uh, uh, decided against them. Rabbi, yeah. is, isn't right. there a group of Jews who follow Shammai that we've there talked were, about? There were Jews who followed Shammai, but over time, look, that's why there's a house of Shammai. There's actually, I mean, this was a, a, a recognized, you know, this is Yale and Harvard or whatever. You know, this is this was a, a uh, you know a, a very respectable group of people, but as I said, it starts from let's say approximately, you know, uh, uh, let's let's say with it with you know let's say it starts from the year one. The Mishnah is codified in two twenty, so this is over two hundred years later. So over those two centuries, that group of scholars became more and more of a minority group. Mm. Uh, if uh, you, I think, uh, Josie, you've been listening to the stories, right? Yeah. In Kosher Salt. Rabbi Eliezer, the guy that we keep on reading more and more stories of his, he's in a uh, hundred years after Hillel and Shammai. He follows Shammai. Shammai, yeah. He's strict. Right? He's, you, you're not surprised, right? No. Right. 
okay. So yes, later on there were sages that still followed Shammai, but more and more and more, the 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 snowball effect was that Shammai was you know uh, you know not in the end accepted as he was a contender, but he didn't quite make it. He didn't quite make it. Okay, we have a little bit more time, so let's see if we, well, not really, but, uh, okay, we've got like a, one more minute. Let's see if we can do a real quick reading of the next paragraph, and then we'll have to come back to it next time. An alternative explanation of the cryptic Baraita. Rava says, the Baraita means the festival offering may be postponed the entire time of the pe festival. More than that, it may not be postponed. As we learned in the Mishnah, one who did not offer the festival offerings on the first day of Yom Tov may offer the offerings throughout the Yom Tov and even on the last day of the Sukkot festival, i.e. Shemini Azaret. 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 If Yom Tov passed and he did not offer the festival offerings, he is no longer responsible for it. Okay. So we're at the end of our time. Just real quick, what this means is that what Rava is saying is that the meaning of this Braita, no, it's actually authoritative. It's not to be understood the way Rabbi Oshaya said it and therefore to be put aside as being unacceptable. But actually, it's totally acceptable. It's a real rule that we follow. And the rule is that usually when we're talking about postponing an ex observance, we postpone it to the next day. So, for instance, if Tisha B'Av is on Shabbat, we can't have it on Shabbat, we put it on to Sunday. But we don't put it on to Monday mm. or Tuesday. It's Sunday or nothing. When it comes to the observance of the Chagiga, the festival offering, if the day of Yom Tov started on Shabbat, we should give the festival offering on Sunday. But what if you don't give it on Sunday? And it's not. The answer is you can give it on Monday and Tuesday. You have the whole festival, right? Passover and, Suk and Sukkot are seven-day festivals. So therefore, you've got the whole week to offer that, that sacrifice. And on Sukkot, you've even got another day, Shmini Atzeret, which is tagged on to Sukkot. So it ends up being that your window of opportunity is not just one day, but actually an extensive period of time. We eventually, it doesn't say it here, but we actually applied this to Shavuot also, even though Shavuot is uh, only a one-day holiday. Um, but uh, uh, we said that it, that it actually has this makeup time uh, for longer. Okay, I want to uh, stop here and wish everybody well. Um, I didn't mention it in the uh, uh Okay, about the session, but uh, today Shomrei is co-sponsoring a pride uh, caravan that's happening at five o'clock. So if you want to jump into your car and uh, and drive around to celebrate the uh, Pride Month, this is June. It's, we're getting to the end of June. So along with Ner Tamid and and uh, uh, BK, um, uh, we're going to do a little uh, uh, car parade that's going to drive around. Uh, Bloomfield and uh, and um, Montclair. Montclair, thank you. At five o'clock, it's in Shomrei week. Okay, everybody is invited. Okay, Paul Tuv, be well. Thank you, thank you, Beryl. That's it.